we'll now talk about the one-time tax on deferred foreign income that existed upon transition to a new territorial system. Okay, we want to talk uh, a little bit about why it's there, what it's meant to achieve, and then a very little about the mechanics because the, the mechanics are very, very convoluted. We will not, uh, in discussion, attempt to get into them in terms of exactly how they work, because they're, uh, they're frankly uh, pretty terrible, um, which is why final regulations, which were issued, uh, I think, just this, uh, this last week, uh, if I remember correctly, they run to like 300 pages, which uh, is typical of, uh, of a lot of these, uh, these new areas. Uh, I don't mean to scare you if you, the idea is to understand the overall, and then when it actually becomes important, whether it's because of a uh, problem you're trying to work through for a course like this, or whether it's uh, for your job situation, you know where to look and you uh, can get into it at that point. Now, we've, we've talked before that, you know, again, the prior system was deferral, and uh, we, of course, know that with the high 35% rate, uh, deferral had a very, very significant value. And uh, uh, we also uh, know that economically, deferral was like an interest-free loan. The theory was that, okay, uh, at some time in the future, uh, the subsidiary, the CFC or other foreign corporation would pay a dividend and the U.S. shareholder would pay tax on it. The point, of course, was that it wasn't just a short-term loan. Uh, there was a chance that there'd never be a need to pay a dividend. Uh, so, you know, just indefinitely, uh, companies would not pay dividends. Uh, uh, there was... Uh, there was an amnesty, uh, sort of a bring the money home holiday in 2004 that allowed a five and a quarter percent rate instead of the 35 percent rate. So effectively that's quite a, uh, uh, quite a savings. So there's all this, there was all this encouragement to maximize profits outside the U.S. for this deferral benefit. When Congress, uh, or at least one portion of Congress, was considering what to, uh, you know, what to actually enact, they, they had a, you know, of course, a number of goals, and we're going to cover some of those as we go forward. But specifically with respect to how do we, you know, get rid of deferral? Uh, how do we unlock all those funds that are sitting in CFCs out there? How do we fund, so to speak, uh, a reduction in tax rate from 35 to 21? And uh, gosh, there's something north of two and a half trillion dollars of as yet untaxed by the U.S., uh, unrepatriated foreign earnings sitting in CFCs. Congress is looking at, it, at this and saying, well, gee, you know, what to do? Um, and they certainly saw this uh, two and a half uh, trillion or more as a sort of a pot of gold. Uh, as early as, uh, what, uh, two or three, four, years ago when, uh, uh, when there was a lot of discussion about the fact that the country needs infrastructure. Uh, that seems to have been forgotten to a large extent, but uh, the need is still there. But one of the things that politicians were linking was, gee, we should tax this two and a half trillion dollars and use the money to pay for infrastructure in this country. Uh, that seems to have been forgotten, but that was a political discussion a few years ago. 
What happened was that when tax reform actually occurred at the end of 2017, and uh, they decided that they would uh, have this big tax cut and the figure of one and a half trillion dollars of you know, increased deficit because of the tax cut would, uh, would be there. This, uh, this savings, so to speak, from try, you know, from somehow taxing this uh, two and a half trillion or more, that was seen as one of the things to reduce the to the one and a half trillion cost, which was obviously, as they did the numbers, was too much above the one one and a half trillion that they were trying to limit it to. Uh, in the build up to the final passage of the thing, the percentage amount of tax that would be attached to this, uh, you know, kept getting a bit higher and higher. Uh, discussions over time, now again, the high of 20% you see there at the bottom, the proposed rates in prior congressional and administrative pr administration proposals, uh, it was uh, uh, the Democratic side that had recommended the 20% and uh, the 3.5% uh, came from the uh, Republican uh, head of the uh, House Ways and Means Committee, if I remember correctly. Uh, uh, Dave Camp was the uh, was the representative who has since uh, retired. Uh, in any case, what we ended up with was a split rate. If we if we think about uh, what a balance sheet looks like. You know, we have assets over here and we have liabilities and capital. If we look at the, uh, and, and if we assume that this is a real, you know, a real operating business, this is not, uh, so to speak, just monkey business. Uh, if we say this is a real operating business, then we see that there will, of course, be some cash there will be inventory, maybe. There will be uh, property, plant, and equipment. There will be uh, uh, other assets, et cetera. If we look at uh, just one example, I, before uh, coming to class, I, I took the opportunity to look at uh, the uh, Form 10-K uh, for Apple for uh, uh, for the last couple of uh, years, the Form 10Ks, using very uh, uh, very round numbers. The balance sheet for their CFC, their balance sheet for what they refer to as foreign their foreign business, which I would suspect is for the most part. Uh, mostly within one, uh, one group of companies, but you know, maybe I'm uh, wrong. Uh, uh, in any case, they had cash was this 250 billion that I mentioned, and PP&E uh, was give or take a little bit, uh, let's say uh, in very round numbers, 25 billion. Now, it makes sense, of course, that a company that's in a real operating business will reinvest some of its earnings in additional inventory, property, plant, and equipment, uh, other assets. Uh, but needless to say, uh, in their case, the 250 is a mite high for the actual needs of their business. Now, recognizing that this 250 could have been dividended back. The uh, Congress, in its, uh, in its, of course, wisdom, said, well, gee, uh, the cash balances, we should tax higher than earnings which have been reinvested in, in a business. 
So we ended up with these percentages that any earnings that were held as cash or other liquid assets, 15.5% would be the tax rate. Now, again, that may sound high, but the, amount, the rate that they would have been taxed at if the money had been paid back as a dividend uh, was 35%. In other words, the rate that would have applied had they paid dividends would have been 35%. Uh, any remaining earnings, in other words, to the extent reinvested in the business, that would be at this 8% rate, which of course is much lower. This was the, uh, this is what they came to as a mechanism to grab some amount from all of these accumulated earnings and reduce, in a sense, uh, the overall cost of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. Now, you might say, well, gee, what about the foreign tax credit? Remember, uh, that's something we've talked about <clears throat> uh, maybe uh, ad nauseum, if, uh, uh, if you want to use the right word. Uh, well, the foreign tax credit enters into that to the extent that Tax, foreign taxes are paid with respect to the earnings that are taxed at 15.5%, then the proportion of foreign taxes relative to that will be allowed as a credit, similarly with the 8%. To make it simple, if we paid $35 of foreign tax, then 15.5 of that 35 would be allowed as a foreign tax credit uh, for the cash portion. Uh, for the 8%, then it would be 8 of that 35. And there would be no foreign tax credit benefit for the, uh, for the excess. Why? Well, if you're not going to be taxed by the US on the, the 35 minus the 15 and a half, then the US should not be granting a foreign tax credit benefit in relation to that. So there's, uh, of course, some logic to that. Now, note that uh, the 15.5% and 8% rates uh, technically apply to all taxpayers. And for corporations, uh, those are pretty much the percentages. For individuals, the way it works out, and again, this is, this is uh, pretty convoluted, uh, it'll depend on what the tax bracket is of the individual as to what his, uh, what his actual benefit uh, or tax cost is on these. First of all, this section 965 is within, uh, let's say, subpart F of the, uh, of the uh, code. The manner of collecting it is within subpart F. And this was I'll call a convenience. You know, we've talked before about the fact that the U.S. has no jurisdiction over uh, a foreign corporation, whether it's a CFC or not, unless that foreign corporation has U.S. assets or conducts a U.S. business or, you know, has some connections with the U.S. Uh, in terms of its property and its activities. But in this case, since the U.S. is trying to collect tax money that is measured by assets that are inside the foreign corporation, it used the subpart F mechanism because the mechanism is there to grab the shareholder with respect to you know, to grab the shareholder, collect the tax from the shareholder, although the amount of tax is measured by uh, what assets and what earnings are inside the subsidiary. So again, jurisdiction trumps. You grab the tax from the shareholder, not directly from the corporation that actually holds the assets. Uh, this term, which you'll find in Section 965, Deferred Foreign Income Corporation, 
that uh, is specifically defined uh, as any foreign corporation that is a CFC or any foreign corporation that has a 10% or greater US corporate shareholder. I frankly have no idea why they did this, but you have a, a real crazy situation here. Two companies that uh, may appear, or in terms of their activities and earnings, might be, uh, might be the same. In other words, let's say one where you have one individual that owns, uh, let's say, 40% of a company and then there's, let's say, some uh, non-US shareholder that owns the 60%. This is not a CFC. There is no corporate US shareholder. So as a result, this would not be covered by 965 and the individual uh, will never be taxed on his share of the earnings that are down here. Except, of course, in the event of an actual distribution. On the other hand, if we have the same situation except that, uh, let's, say, uh, let's say this is 30 instead of 40, and we have a US corporate shareholder, which owns 10, now 965 does apply and both the individual and the, uh, the, the US corporation have to pay this transition tax. This doesn't make a lot of sense uh, to me. Uh, maybe, there's, maybe there's a good logic, but uh, I just don't see it. Uh, there's Again, uh, a lot of detail. I will not go into it. If you, I certainly uh, say if you have some interest, by all means, sit down with the code and read through the stuff. Uh, I certainly recommend that. But it's, it's, it's very convoluted and uh, uh, not, uh, not one of the easier sections in the uh, code to deal with. Now, uh, what's the timing? Okay, the timing is that this is calculated and paid for the last taxable year of the foreign corporation that begins before January 1st of 2018, which primarily means for a calendar year 2017 uh, uh, being the year when this is calculated and paid. You'll also find something in the code which, again, you sort of scratch your head over, but there's a reason for it. The amount of income to recognize is the greater of the deferred foreign income as of November 2nd or December 31st. Now, the reason for that November 2nd is because that was the date uh, when uh, this specific thing was proposed in one of the committees. I don't remember which one, whether it was Ways and Means or uh, the Senate Finance Committee, but it was proposed and made public on that day. The expectation is that as soon as people, companies know about this, they will start playing games to reduce the level of assets reduce the level of earnings uh, that would be otherwise be subjected to this, uh, tra this uh, transition tax. So as a result, they said the greater of November 2nd or December 31st. And the same thing with the cash position. They give an approach to prevent game playing with respect to uh, uh, the cash position, because remember the cash position is 15 and a half percent. If you lower your cash, then the amount that's taxable at eight will go up, the amount that's taxable at 15 and a half will go down. So this again was to uh, try to prevent uh, game playing. Now a very simple example, very simple, uh, US corporate shareholder 
positive earnings and profits in one CFC, a deficit in the other. In other words, CF, the uh, CFC2, so to speak, on the right uh, has operated at a loss and has a deficit. And also, we note the cash positions of the two companies, 20 in one, 40 in the other, totaling 60. The results of that uh, is that you reduce the 100 by the 20. In other words, you can offset the positive by the negative so that the earnings that will be subject to this transition tax become 80. There are 60 of cash, so that 60 is subject to the 15.5%, 20 is subject to the 8%, and that gives a tax of 10.9. Uh, I guess this gets to uh, what I'll call maybe monkey business with respect to how the budgeting is for determining uh, how much the deficit's going to be and how much it's not going to be. And uh, there's a 10-year window on, uh, on uh, how you gauge this, you know, the amount of the deficit uh, that's going to arise from a, a possible tax change. So what they did was they, okay, pushed up the percentages, but they pushed out the actual payments. All taxpayers that owe this transition tax, they are given the right to elect to pay in installments. Okay, gee, that's pretty nice, uh, pay in installments. Oh, by the way, there's no interest charge on these installments. Would you elect to pay in installments if there were no interest charge? Yeah, you couldn't, uh, you couldn't start raising your head, uh, nodding your head fast enough. But because of the higher percentage rates applied, it essentially works to be an interest charge? Uh, well, economically, uh, yes, uh, no question. Uh, however, uh, from the standpoint of the game playing with the budgetary uh, situation, you don't uh, apparently account for that within the budgetary considerations. So at the end of the day, this 15.5% and 8% are economically, from the standpoint of the taxpayer, much lower because, as you can see from the schedule of payments, the payments are really back-ended. 60% of the payments are made in years six, seven, and eight. When you look at the present value, it's much, much lower than what it appears to be. We've talked about section 959 several times, okay? To the extent that this amount of earnings has been included in the transition tax calculation, that creates a previously taxed income account which now allows actual payments of dividends, but they will not be treated as additional income, or there will, there will be no double counting when the money is actually brought back. Now, a big part of the intention behind this was, of course, to bring, it was to encourage all these groups to bring money back because, gee, that's where all these additional American jobs are going to come from. Has there been much physically brought back? Okay, these, uh, these are some numbers that have come out uh, relatively recently that the actual amount that's been repatriated following this transition tax that increased the 959 previously taxed income accounts the amount that's come back in total is, give or take a bit, about five or six hundred million dollars out of that two and a half billion. I'm sorry, two and a half trillion that uh, was estimated uh, uh, to be out there. And this is seen as being relatively small. Any ideas as to why companies might not 
be all excited to bring money back quickly. You said regs do change. Uh, well, that's that's a fair comment, but I don't think in this case uh, this is this in a sense is. Uh, uh, you're right that the regs uh, uh, weren't finalized until I think last week, but, uh, but uh, I don't think that's so, that's so much it. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't mean to speak over you. But you're still repatriating money that's going to then exist in a higher tax system going forward, most likely. So if it, yeah. even if you okay. repatriate those dollars back into investment accounts, you're still entering a higher tax situation. So the dollars. Okay, that's a very good comment, and frankly, that's one that I hadn't thought of. Uh, so, yeah, that's a very good, uh, very good comment. Uh, if it's sitting in this foreign company and it's being taxed at either zero or a very low level within that country, but on the other hand, what did we say about uh, foreign personal holding company income? I guess I'm still thinking about... You know, the fact that if you repatriate money into our tax system... And you know, You're absolutely right that bringing it back, you know it's going to be taxable at 21%, uh, assuming that you're a, uh, a U.S. corporation. Here, we're speaking of the income that's generated by the assets that are distributed back. For example, if cash is distributed back, the interest... Uh, the tax on the interest is what we're talking about. Uh, money has come back, but a lot of it has been used primarily for share buybacks, where companies buy back shares from their shareholders. That's, that's been the biggest use of it. Uh, but what other reasons might there be, though, as to why uh, they would not necessarily want to jump and bring the money back uh, immediately? Is there... Uh, if we were looking at the opposite direction, and many of you have taken T515, does the U.S. have a withholding tax when a U.S. company pays a dividend to a foreign owner? Okay, so in some cases, some of this uh, $2.5 trillion is sitting in a country where there would be a withholding tax on the dividend when it's distributed to the uh, to the U.S. Uh, parent. Now, that sort of gets back a little more to your point, well, gee, it's better to keep it where it is because maybe it's being taxed low in that country. Now, there. remember, again, getting back to subpart F for a moment, this kind of income on those cash balances, dividends, interest, capital gains on investments, and so on, all of those things are included in foreign-based company uh, income. I'm sorry, uh, foreign personal holding company income. And as a result, the earnings on those will generally be taxable immediately to the shareholder in the United States anyway, the earnings on it. So it's probably other factors, withholding taxes, or maybe they really don't have a an immediate need in the U.S. for the money? Yeah, what's, what's the incentive to repatriate? You're going to have administrative costs as well to kind of reorganize and move stuff around. Yeah. Why bother? And sort of getting back to your point, not so much the regulations, but maybe other rules will change that make it beneficial to still have that money in the, uh, the overseas company. It's getting to... Uh, uh, a, a corollary of your point. So anyway, there's been this situation and uh, uh, relatively speaking, not a lot has come back and there's been a lot in the press that uh, gee, uh, there was uh, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act didn't effectively cause the money to come back home. Okay, now any, uh, any questions on the transition tax? Well, then uh, in the next, in, well, just slide deck, but uh, we'll next talk about, uh, at the next session, we'll talk about uh, there's FDII, there's guilty. Uh, those, uh, those are the principal things that uh, we'll be talking about. So uh, any, uh, any questions or uh, do you want to escape? 
Yeah, I'm asking you, Michael. <laughs> you're stuck here. Yeah, you're, 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 you even have a class in this room. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you very much.